Your voice, your opinion, your community. Fact TV, free speech, protected. Welcome to The Long Road. I'm your host, Chris Roberts. We're going to talk about private equity. What is private equity and what does private equity have to do with you or me? <clears throat> but before I um, get on to the private equity, I just want to make sure I clarify something um, concerning what I said in last week's show, concerning migrants um, being flown in the country from um, different um, countries, mostly um, South America and the Caribbean, like Haiti, Venezuela, Cuba. Okay. <clears throat> I did a little bit more research on that. According to the federal government, they are stating that um, the people have to um, get on the app, use the app, and get approved to come to the United States and to file an asylum claim. But it also said that um, the individuals had to pay their own pl plane ticket. So <clears throat> the United States government didn't worry about or didn't care about where you got your money for the plane ticket. But then again, <clears throat> a plane ticket from Venezuela or a plane ticket from Haiti, one way, maybe five, six hundred dollars. And that would be an easy amount to get. Someone in the States could Venmo you that money. You can then buy a ticket and then you could get on one of the chartered aircraft. One of the things it was saying, well, at least someone from Venezuela wouldn't have to go through Colombia and the Darien Rainforest in Panama and up through um, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Mexico, up to the U.S. border. So, <clears throat> I don't understand. I don't know how the system works which ones get chosen over the other ones because it wouldn't really make sense for me if I'm in Venezuela to pay, uh, pay a human trafficker five, ten thousand dollars or maybe more to get me from Venezuela up to the United States and um, when maybe I can get the app, go on the um, app, get approved, and get my ticket, and fly on one of the flights into the United States. <clears throat> and because in the um, New York Post and some of the other ones, the um, they were talking about... Um, <clears throat> the number of women, one woman was arrested. She said she only made $1,200, but she needed to come up with $3,000 a week to um, pay the traffickers that got her up <clears throat> into the United States. So to me, you know what? 
if I'm a young lady, I would much rather pay 700 bucks to get on a plane, custom plane to bring me to the United States, get processed and moved on to another city, then have um, a smuggler get me in, and then I have to prostitute myself to earn the money to pay this smuggler back. And so I just wanted to clarify it and um, with a little bit more information, but anytime you get more information, it leads to additional questions. <clears throat> but I sometimes think that these well-educated people in the federal government think we're idiots and um, that we can't think for ourselves. Sometimes they're right, but most often they're not right at all. <clears throat> so back to the main topic of the show. I don't know if I'll be able to get everything done um, in this um, next 50 minutes. But You've been hearing the word private equity more and more. When I was doing research on um, the private equity and stuff, in the five areas <clears throat> around the city of Atlanta, private equity companies own 19,000 single family homes. And they're charging rent. In most cases, the rent is pretty high. Other cases, if they can't get the right people, they're not um, renting the houses out at all. About three, four weeks ago, I had a phone call. The guy individual a call, individual called me up and says, um, you interested in selling your house? I says, no. He goes and says, well, what about if I can give you an offer? And he goes, $200,000. He goes, do I have you thinking now? <clears throat> Give me. He says, I'm going to pass you on to the next individual. Next individual comes on and says, we're, built, we're willing to give you a cash offer on your house, sight unseen, and um, so I asked the guy, the, the second person, second person says 124000 to 176000 I go, nope, hung up. For the next couple of weeks, I get badgered and badgered and badgered <clears throat> on my phone, text, and the individual, third individual calls, he says, you know, when we usually get people on the line and we get them to um, willing to listen, the people usually buy, usually sell out. He says, what's wrong with you? I says, well, I have no interest in selling my house. And he got ticked at me because I wouldn't sell my house. So basically, it's like, hey, cold call. Say, hey, you know what? We'll pay a cash amount for your house. They get you hooked. And then it goes, oh, now you're gonna lowball me. You're gonna buy me a house, pay me what my way below what my house is appraised for. 
and so they want you to wiggle okay they want my house because they're looking at it and they can say we can make money off of Mr. Robinson's house Warren Buffett's company Berkshire bought tens of thousands of family houses and they bought them when the interest rates were like two, three percent, it was hardly no risk to them. The prices of houses were going up and they bought them and the value, the capital gain part on it made them really successful and made them a lot of money. And so if you go in and want to buy a house and you can tell when you go around looking at the um, the for sale signs there's a high probability if you're seeing the for sale signs out of one of those big national companies that do high-end housing and sales which is owned by Berkshire Hatfield, then not a local, you have to compete with them. <clears throat> and so, and they're doing it just to make money, not to improve the neighborhood, and they're looking at it to make a quick buck. Okay, and so what private equity had been doing is finding a way to use other people's money to buy stuff and then sell off a lot of that stuff at a profit. <clears throat> well, so I got a couple of things. I got <clears throat> Harvard Medical in research, they did what happens when a private equity takes over a hospital. The one recently in Atlanta, last um, Atlanta Magazine, less than a year ago, when private equity firms bankrupt their own companies, and then uh, kind of a detailed report from um, Harvard Business School, research on what private equity has been doing. And the one from Atlantic and the one from Harvard, in their case studies, they're going to do, <clears throat> excuse me, they talk about a company that we already know friendlies. Keen used to have two friendlies and now we have none. Friendlies was really big around New England and now it's um, pretty much gone. It goes, private equity firms buy businesses in hope of flipping them for a profit a few years later. So a private equity company does not have any long-term future. They're looking at how can I buy something and get it done and turn over it real quickly. Well, if I go in and buy a company that's not doing really well and look at the long-term future and then you're a private equity fund going in to look for a short-term profit. The private equity companies have 10 times <clears throat> likely to go bankrupt than other people coming in investing money into those companies. Friendlies. It was started during the Great Depression. 
Their mother made their coffee flavored syrup, something most people only from New England know or drank coffee flavored syrup. The brothers worked, one worked at night, the other one worked in the day so they can sleep, making their ice cream. Then when, when they went to war, they said, we're closing down friendlies and we will not open up friendlies again until we win the war. The owners, the Blake brothers, finally retired. And then Friendly circled through a series of owners in 2007 when it was acquired by the private equity firm Sun Capital. Under Sun's Capital's ownership, Friendly struggled. Among other things, a private equity firm piled debt into the business. Okay, so it went to Friendlies and says, okay, guys, we own the property that your store is under. And so what we're going to do is if you want to stay there, you have to <clears throat> sell the store to us and we'll lease it back to you and lease back the property for some 160 friendly restaurants. Okay. But the lease back and property rent was so high. <coughs> but friendlies couldn't pay. But Every month that was going by, <clears throat> Sun Capital was making money off of Friendlies. But Sun Capital owned Friendlies. But it would go, so why is Sun Capital making the people, making Friendlies buy back? Sun Capital buy Friendlies and says, Friendlies, oh, you got to pay his rent and you got to lease the buildings at a higher rate from us. And you go, wait a minute, Sun Capital owns it? Why are they doing this? Because it doesn't make any business sense. But it got to a point that Sun Capital put Friendly's back into bankrupt. So under Sun Capital's ownership, again, if you probably hear is Delaware. Corporations want to either go to Delaware or <clears throat> South Dakota. Delaware is so corporate friendly and South Dakota has unlimited um, interest rates on debt. So Sun Capital has Friendly's owners file for bankruptcy in Delaware. Then Friendly's lawyers tell the judge, we got to do this sale real quick. Okay. To a, a bankruptcy process call a 363 sale. <clears throat> the Friendlies was then auctioned off free of its prior debts. You go, wait a minute. So all these other things that Friendly owns, they're going for bankrupt. See, but Sun Capital owns Friendly so wouldn't Sun Capital suffer a price, a cost? Well, no. <clears throat> so, say for example, Sun Friendly says, you know what, I got $200 million in debt, okay? So, 
Sun Capital decided we're going to buy friendlies out of bankruptcy. And how are we going to buy friendlies out of bankruptcy? Okay. What we'll do is we will forgive friendlies $200 million in debt. It's a tactic known as credit bid bidding. But the thing was, only Sun Capital could do this. Anybody else who wanted to bid for friendlies out of bankruptcy had to come up with real money. So if it was going to cost two hundred million, so if I wanted to buy friendlies, I would have to come up with two hundred million dollars, bank loans, cash, stock. That's what I would have to do. But Sun Capital goes, you know what? We'll take friendlies, and we'll wipe out friendlies two hundred million dollars. So they go. Mm, that's pretty nice of Sun Capital. Why? So they had a company, they bankrupt the company, then they said, we will buy the company back based on how, by writing off their debts. But we're the only one who can do that, but everyone else has to come up with real cash. So, bingo. What is the benefit for Sun Capital of doing that? You remember when I said that <clears throat> Friendlies was put up for sale because all its other debts, quote, were going to be wiped out. Okay, at the time of bankruptcy, Friendly's had $115 million in pension liabilities. Okay, so so by selling Friendly's to one of its affiliates, Sun Capital sold friendly to one of its affiliates that falls on them. Sun Capital reacquired its own company free and clear of those liabilities. So I bankrupt friendlies. I then go and say I sell friendly to a subdivision in my company. So I now get the company friendlies back, but the hundred and fifteen million dollars that in pensions is gone. So that's a hundred and fifteen million dollars of obligation that is completely gone. Well, but what happens to that hundred and fifteen million dollar liability? Well, that goes on to the federal government. The Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, a government charter insurance that rescues underfunded pension and whose work was paid for by other more responsible pending funds. Sun Capital was able to re reacquire Friendly's free of its pension obligation without spending any of the money that it had lent out. So, anything more than the money that it had lent out. Pensioners lost in this process because their payments were at risk of being cut and they were cut. Many of the changed existing employees lost that well. 
So part of this bankruptcy deal, 63 friendlies were closed. <clears throat> when the New York Times in 2020 and 2012 asked about the failure of friendlies and its argued manipulation of the bankruptcy law, the, the, um, the co-founder for um, Sun Capital says, quote, we don't make the rules. Friendly wasn't Sun Capital's only victim. The firm um, similarly pushed the midware grocer um, Marsh supermarket into bankruptcy. Marsh at the time owed $62 million in pension obligation to its warehouse plus mean more to the store employees. But look at this. A separate fund for the company's executives remain fully funded. So that $62 million in obligation for pensioners went to the federally chartered <clears throat> and millions more for its other store employees. Through bankruptcy, Sun Capital was able to offload March's unfunded pension obligations. They engaged in similar pension laundering in the works of the PBGC um, director with the looming pot maker and the Lex and generator manufactured power mate. Sun Capital shows a recurring enthusiasm for abandoning the pensions of the company it bought. The Sun Capital disregard for friendly work is extended beyond the effort to dump its pension obligations. The company should have pro could have provided advance notice of the impending shutdown to workers at the 63 restaurants slated to be closed as part of the bankruptcy filing. Since the bankruptcy was clearly planned well in the head, instead st workers at those stores were told one evening that the next day would be their last. About 1,260 employees, well over 10% of the company's workforce of 10,000 were laid off. The Warren Act requires um, companies to give 90-day no advance notice of a mass layoff, but only if the company has 50 or more full-time employees at a particular site. No friendlies had 50 or more full-time workers. Most of the workers at friendlies were part-time. In New York, they have its own Warren Act at 25 or more workers. It, it was possibly that up to six of the close friendlies in New York may have had 25 um, or more full-time employees. And so over 1,200 employees get a 24-hour notice. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> it's not the first time Sun Capital firm was burdened with debt, saddled with above market rent in sales lease back agreements for facilities, and refusing a fuse and injection of cash from the private equity firm that could help it survive. The bank's bankruptcy of West Coast Department Store Mervins. We used to shop there quite a bit. Great store resulted in 30,000 people losing their jobs and vendors getting stiffed out of over $100 million in product. And so,
He's done it before. Family, friendly family restaurant, ice cream chain. <clears throat> and so that's what a venture capitalist does. <clears throat> Not all are self-serving, as this stuff shows. For and um, Sun Capital is not the only one. Watson, thirteen and company, and the Hatfield Capital Management LP brought the specialty food realtor Harry and David. They also forced the company into bankruptcy and pushed pension obligations onto the pension insurer, but not before giving themselves $80 million in dividends. <clears throat> Similarly, another private equity firm bought the grocer AMP. We know about AMP out of bankruptcy and send it back in a few years, pushing the pension obligation. In the pot. When it declared bankruptcy a second time, it did not nearly achieve as much was needed to turn around the business. <clears throat> the, um, when I go to the Harvard one in 2015, Harvard, said private equity pushed more than, from 2001 to 2014, pushed more than 50 companies into bankruptcy and sh shredded more than $1.5 billion <clears throat> in pension obligations And um, in the process, pensioners lost $128 million in benefits. And the thing about the um, <clears throat> capital venture, I can get tax breaks by writing off debt. So if I use 80, quote, I should find a way, use 80% <clears throat> to buy a company. I use, say, 80, 90% of debt, bad debt, to buy the company, or break, we'll just say debt. Debt is not bad until you stop paying for it. So I use that debt to buy that company I extract as much profit out of that company. And then if the company goes bankrupt, then I can use that debt as a tax deduction because debt is good. The, um, the one with Michael Douglas and um, Leonardo Capaccio, can't pronounce the word, where they were just being um, hedge funds and venture funds, just buying out, uh, I think it was the Wolf of um, Wall Street, just buying out companies to, um, to sell them not caring what happened to the people. And so, <clears throat> we'll go to this one. Do private equity firms, do you know that private equity firms can affect your health? It could even cost you your life. 
And you go, what do you mean? Well, what happens when private equity takes over a hospital? By Jake Miller, December 26, 2023, from Harvard Medical School. At a glance, right off the bat, <clears throat> a na national study of quality of care in hospitals acquired by private equity shows worsening or a much higher increase of falls and a higher infection um, risk <clears throat> and other measurements of quality and safety. Some post-procedure adverse events increase even through private equity hospitals perform fewer patient procedures among <clears throat> young and less disadvantaged um, it's older and less dis um, fewer procedures. The new findings amplify existing economic concerns about the growth of this poor for-profit ownership mo um, model. The findings come amidst growing concerns about private equity increasing their role in healthcare. When in the last 10 years, $1 trillion was invested by private equity firms in buying up hospitals, nonprofit hospitals. Hospital success is measured not only in dollars or the number of patients who pass through the doors, but also in the life saved, complication rates, patient satisfaction, and a number of other quality and um, <clears throat> safety metrics. The hospital medical researcher, a physician at uh, Mass General Hospital, we need to make sure we fully understand the cost and benefits of predominantly new force in healthcare. Again, the economic repercussions of private equity acquisitions are not a new concern. Previous studies <clears throat> of Dr. Brunch from the University of Chicago, Chicago indicates that this high debt for profit financial model or hospital own, own Ownership may also be leading to increased spending and other economic implications. Many have expressed concern about hospital bankruptcies under private equity ownerships that often leave underserving populations with limited assets to care. Hey, if, for example, if I was a private equity company and I came in and bought Cheshire Medical and I tried to extract as much money as possible out of it and I can't get any more by providing medical service and the easiest way for me to um, get my last piece of um, investment reward is allowing the hospital to go bankruptcy so I, bankrupt so I can take the tax break, I'm gonna do it because I have no loyalty to the hospital and I have no loyalty to the city of Keene. And in a lot of times, they, they will come in by the hospital, put um, their own people in with their number one priority is to increase profitability or return on investment. Not profitability, but return on investment. When a health system buys hospitals, they generally do not use borrowed money. In contrast, the classic private equity buyout uses a small amount of cash and a large amount of debt. Because if I'm going to come in and take a loan out to buy it, 
I have to go to bank institutes or things like that. And there's rules and federal stuff that I have to follow. There's reports I have to give. But say, for example, I go and say, hey, I need $2 billion to buy Cheshire Medical. I can go, for example, some like Elon Musk and say, hey, I need some help from you. Can you do this? Is what I, this is what I expect your return on investment to be. Um, Treasure Medical is a billion in the hole. I'm just using this to make me up. And, but for two billion, I can buy the whole thing. Okay, and so <clears throat> basically, I only need one billion because we're going to make a way to make that debt as part of the cost. I'll go to Cheshire Medical and say, yeah, you're worth $2 billion, but you got a billion dollars in debt, so this is what we're going to do. I'm going to give you a billion dollars, and I'm going to wipe, I'm going to take your debt away from you. So people at Cheshire Medical, they've got their value. And so... Bingo. That's a billion dollars I didn't have to come up with. I'm just saying, hey, I'm going to buy your debt for you. I'll, I will take away your debt from you. The debt doesn't go away. The debt is still there, which I can use at a later date. <clears throat> <clears throat> a private equity firm raises some capital from investment, borrows the rest, putting debt on the required hospital with its physical assets such as land building as collateral for a loan. The required hospital must then generate revenue to pay down their debt. So hey, I buy the hospital. So the assets of the hospital are a billion bucks. All of a sudden, that billion bucks becomes collateral. And so you got to pay down some of this loan and all this other stuff. Well, my newly um, instilled leader, CEO or chief financial officer of the newly acquired for profit Cheshire Medical has to come up with money. He has to make money, he or she has to make money to cover those monthly um, payments. <clears throat> so the private equity generates revenue by um, charging management fees to its investors. The pension fund. Oh yeah, you know, we do have a pension fund of $100 million. Okay, we're gonna charge you 5% a year, to take care of that. The endowment, you have an endowment of $120 million, we're gonna charge you 5%. And, oh, you have this thing working for you, we're, we're gonna charge all these man, management fees. And then, it goes, we only want high revenue procedures, cost cut and reorganization, financial engineering. Yeah, I bet you didn't learn that one in school. <clears throat> Private equity firms want to buy growing concerns <clears throat> that are able to take on debt and generate revenue in the short term. These financial pressures can create perverse incentives favoring profit over patients, the researchers have shown. For the study, the researchers examined insurance claim data for all paid for fee-for-service Medicare um, hospitalization from 2009 to 2012, totaling more than 600,000 hospitalizations 
at 51 private equity hospitals and more than 4 million hospitalizations at 259 similar hospitals, basically for non, not for profit hospitals. The pro hospitals not acquired by private equity served as a control group to control for other factors may affect the outcome. <clears throat> the researchers compared how patients experienced certain outcomes before and after the hospital was required by private equity. For example, they looked at how often patients fell water in the hospital, how often they developed an infection after procedure or surgery. They also analyzed the makeup of the patient's population, various outcomes, such as how, how often patients died, how often they stayed at the hospital, and how often they ended up being remitted re-admitted. <clears throat> After a hospital is required by private equity, admitted Medicare patients had a 25% in increased hospital acquired complications compared to patients before, before acquisitions. Patients all had a 27% more falls and 38% more bloodstream infections caused by, uh, <clears throat> by central, the, those surgi temporary surgically um, in inserted ports so they can put intravenous um, access, receiving repeated drug effusions or the treatment that would increase 38. This was seen despite private equity hospitals placing 16% lower central lines before the buyout. So the number of lines they put in and ports they put in dropped by 16% but the number of infections increased by 38%. All these results were calculated while taking into account changes, trends, and patterns over the time period at pair hospitals not owned by private equity to isolate the, um, <clears throat> the differences that were due to change in ownership. The study also showed a small drop in hospital deaths at private equity hospitals. This, the research say, may be due to social and demographic um, <clears throat> factors. This is where the front part was wrong. Private equity patients were younger than at a regular hospital. A nonprofit hospital took in more older people. For profit hospitals, took in more younger people after they went. <clears throat> also, for nonprofit hospitals, they not only took in Medicare, but they also took in Medicaid. For for profit hospitals, they took in less poor people. If you were younger and you had good insurance and things like that, you were going to be more than welcome into a for profit hospital. I remember a few years ago, I was told that Cheshire Medical spends about $4 million a year in what's called charity care. They write off over $4 million to take care of people because this in this area right here, we get a lot of people in low income. We get a lot of people on Medicaid. We get a lot of people on the different um, Obamacare stuff or, <clears throat> but so, 
but a lot of these people wouldn't be getting through the front door to uh, in the profit. And you go, hey, Mr. Roberts, you're wrong. A hospital has to take anybody that comes into the emergency room. That's right. Anybody that comes into the emergency room, but I don't have to, if I'm a private doctor, I don't have to take any Medicaid patients. Or I don't even have to take Medicare patients. But the other part is yes. I have to take you if you show up in my emergency room. But I don't have to keep you. You go, what do you mean? If I'm showing up in the emergency room and I need services, what does that mean? You don't have to. No. All I have to do is stabilize you. And the research shows more patients get transferred out of for, for, for profit hospitals than for non-profit hospitals. The company guy goes, I'm here to make a profit. You know what? If I can have you and stabilize you, as soon as I stabilize you, I'm sending you out to some other place, some place that has to take you. And so, and the, um, <clears throat> you remember when I said that <clears throat> for people that, um, for in profit hospitals, for profit hospitals had a lower death rate than for nonprofit hospitals? Within a month of leaving the hospital, a profit hospital, the death rate increased to the point it was higher than nonprofit hospitals. So that means is they were finding ways, hey, we gotta get this guy out of here. We gotta get this woman out of here. Hey, they're gonna cost us money Medicare isn't going to cover everything. I don't want this person dying at my place because not a moneymaker. So they find a way to ship you out to another hospital. So you get shipped out to a community hospital or things like that. And then bing, you, you die. It's an increased risk. They do procedures to make sure you don't <clears throat> die on their watch because you dying on their watch is not a money maker. The other thing, what they would be doing is, wow, why am I getting 52 blood tests when I got a stomach? because they know the federal government, whether it's Medicare or whatever, is only going to pay so much. So, if it goes in, okay, the federal government's going to pay $12 for an EKG. Oh, it takes less than a minute? Let's run the EKG. Oh, let's do all this blood work. I'm going to get paid so much for each of the blood work. So it's called kind of like stacking, putting all these procedures on, knowing that you're only going to get paid a certain amount for each one. But even if you get $13 for an EKG, it doesn't cost you $13 for to do an EKG. You can do an EKG and um, hey, you might make three or four dollars here, three or four. So then 
when time the bill comes and time you get a payment from the insurance company or you get the for Medicare, you're going to make a profit off each individual. Okay, insurance companies are getting really concerned too. Because insurance companies, their job is to reduce costs and make a profit. And out of their real own self-interest, they're finding that <clears throat> these hospitals that are owned by venture capitalists are finding ways to tweak out every single penny possible from the insurance companies. And what they're finding out is the quality of the service provided by for-profit venture-owned hospitals is not meeting, it's not getting the same standards as a nonprofit hospital. And nonprofit hospitals stay around. Venture capitals, when they're not no longer making a profit, they'll shut it down. And there's hundreds of hospitals around the United States that have been shut down by venture capitalists. So those are the two things. I wanted to get the A and P. I wanted to get the hospitalization in and friendly. This is what venture capitalists do. They're not here to benefit us. They're really here to screw us. So that's all it for this week, and have a good day.